couple of talks, actually for the rest of the afternoon, but for the next couple of talks before the break, we are making a hard right turn into invasive species. So, welcome to that part of the program. <laughs> Our next speaker is Kelsey Alvarez de Castillo. Um, she's going to be talking about salinity tolerance around Gobi. So, obviously, this is a huge deal for the Hudson River and other environs down in our marine district and elsewhere in the world. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to let Kelsey talk to you about our favorite invasive. Okay. What favorite invasive guys? Hi everybody, my name is Kelsey Alvarez Del Castillo. I'm a master's student at Cornell University and today I'm going to be talking about my project focusing on the salinity tolerance of round goby. Maybe. beginning in 1990 in the Great Lakes region. Their native range encompasses the Black and Caspian Seas, which are brackish systems. However, you can see they very quickly colonized the major Great Lakes system and have rapidly been expanding out from there into other major freshwater systems. They've most recently made their way eastward across New York State via the Erie Canal. If you're interested in that work, um, check out Scott George's talk this afternoon. Um, but they most recently made their way to the Hudson River Estuary in the summer of 2021. So even though round goby are small benthic fish, they can have major impacts to those ecosystems they invade. For example, they outcompete our native benthic species, they consume fish eggs of other species, and they're vectors for multiple diseases. However, they are a great food source for a lot of fish, um, and they do consume invasive mussels. So managers are concerned about the spread of the Hudson River estuary based on these impacts, and a great way to try to predict that spread is to test the salinity tolerance. Just to familiarize you all with the hydrology of the Hudson River Estuary, the estuary itself runs from Troy, New York, all the way down to New York City. The freshwater portion of the estuary is all the way up top. Oh boy, I'm really screwing this up, aren't I? Forget the laser. Um, oh, she's the bees in uh, Albany, New York, and then continues on down. That freshwater portion remains so until we hit the salt front, which is around the Poughkeepsie or Newburgh region. And then we really don't start to see too strong of a salinity influence until you reach Havistar Bay. Continuing on south, um, that salinity level just continues to increase until you eventually reach the ocean at 33 parts per thousand. There's two major river systems that feed off the estuary into western portions of Long Island Sound, seen at the bottom of the map there. Since the first documented catch of round goby in 2021, a majority of the fish caught have been up in that freshwater portion in Albany. The fog that is south, a physical goby has been caught, has been just north of Newburgh. And then with recent eDNA detections, the farther south we have, we have had a positive detection has been just south of Newburgh. So based on this um, routine sampling and eDNA testing, it appears as though for now round goby are still hanging out in the primarily freshwater portion of the estuary. I recommend checking out Rich Pendleton's poster at the poster session to learn more about that. Okay, so for my study design, ideally we wanted to sample gobies from the estuary to use in these trials. We tried multiple days of sampling and did not catch nearly enough. So we ended up sampling as close to that invasion front as possible, which landed us at the confluence of the Mohawk River and Hudson River near Peoples Island State Park, where we backpack electroshocked for them. And then to supplement our sample size, we just use seine nets on the shoreline of Oneida Lake. They're very plentiful, they're very easy to catch, and that's where I was based out running these experiments. 
So I ran two different iterations of these salinity trials. The first is at an optimal, a bioenergetically optimal temperature from, for round booby at 20 degrees Celsius. The salinity levels in tanks were increased three parts per thousand every week. And I used 10 mohawk gobies and 10 oneida gobies in one tank, separated by a plastic divider to keep those fish from the two water bodies separated. The second iteration that we looked at was whether temperature had an impact on their salinity tolerance. So we picked a higher and lower temperature, somewhat representative of the extremes found in the Hudson River. However, we were slightly limited based on equipment capabilities. We only used oneida fish in the second iteration since there was no significant difference between mohawk and oneida gobies. And once again, I was based at Oneida, and they were much easier to catch there. So I checked tanks twice daily for morti mortality, and then we created a scoring metric to try to quantitatively measure stress in the tanks three days a week. Oh, boy. <laughs> Anyways, so we wanted to devise a way to quantitatively measure stress in the tanks without handling fish and created a vitality score. These are used in the commercial fishery realm and observer protocols, so I pulled from those in my own preliminary work um, to try to come up with different metrics to try to quantitatively measure those stress levels, like I said. The first metric up there is appetite. Very simple. It's just whether fish were eating or not. If fish are eating, that was deemed the healthy or unstressed behavior. The second metric is coloration. I noticed with preliminary work, brown goby started as a uniform pale color, and as they got stressed, the coloration changed to a dark mottled um, color, which changing in coloration is a really common stress response in a lot of other fish species. Lastly was reaction. So I learned that these fish became habituated to lab conditions pretty quickly. They associated somebody standing in front of the tank with food, so they actually moved from the back to the front. They'd come out of their little PVC shelters to the front. So if fish were moving to the front of the tank, that was deemed a healthy or unstressed behavior. These pictures here depict the difference between a healthy versus a stressed goby. You can see that change in coloration, and I can tell you that goby on the bottom was not eating or moving. So what we can do is we can look at the proportion of fish in the tanks that are exhibiting these unstressed or healthy behaviors and compare them to between the control and the experimental tanks. I have this color scaling here, so if 70 to 100% of fish in the tanks were deemed healthy or unstressed, that's green, meaning there's low levels of stress in the tank. Moderate levels of stress is when 40 to 60% of fish in the tank are showing signs of stress. And then 0 to 30% is going to be high levels of stress in the tank seen in red. And you can see right off the bat, this is just one example of one tank, but through the control tanks, it's green across the board throughout the whole trial. And then you can see um, in the experimental tank, it's mostly green through 21 parts per thousand. And then once we hit 24 parts per thousand, um, we see some yellow sprinkled in, and then by the time we're halfway through 27 parts per thousand, um, the tank, almost all of the fish were stressed, if not all of the fish were stressed in the tank. So we can average these scores um, and compare them throughout the whole trial. There we go. And we get something that looks like this. So on the x-axis here, we have salinity. On the y-axis, we have proportion of fish. Our three metrics are going to be the columns and our temperature treatment is going to be the rows. Experimental gobies are in the black circles, and the control tanks are the open gray squares. So you can see with appetite and coloration, there's a pretty sharp decline starting at 24 parts per thousand, and it just continues to decline from there. Reaction, there's a slight drop at 21, but then we see it's very quickly followed by a more drastic drop at 24 parts per thousand. So we can compare this bioenergetically optimal temperature treatment to our warm water treatment tank, and we see that the curves are very similar. However, they shifted to the left three parts per thousand. So we see a decline in appetite at 21, a slight decline in coloration, but a pretty significant drop at 24. And then once again, a drop at 21 parts per thousand in reaction for that warm water treatment. This was anticipated since warmer water tends to increase metabolism and osmoregulation rates and energy demands. So we think that these fish um, were getting stressed at those earlier salinities or lower salinity levels due to that physiological stress in addition to that salt stress that we were putting them through. Lastly, the cold water tanks yielded some very interesting results. Um, you can see for the first seven weeks of the trial, experimental and controlled gobies were not eating in those tanks. And then starting at week eight, individuals did begin to eat and continue on through the rest of the trial. So there was close to 20% of remaining experimental gobies at 33 parts per thousand that were actually eating, which was very surprising to me. 
And then comparing, um, spanning over to color and reaction, you can see there is no disparity between our control and our experimental group. So these fish were dark and not moving. Our main takeaway from this is that these fish were in an overwintering regime with a much, much lower metabolic rate. I anecdotally noticed um, decreases in operculum beats in these cold water fish as well. So our inference is that since there was no disparity between the control and the experimental fish in these cold water treatments, like the other two temperature treatments, that these fish were not stressed. So switching from physical observations of stress to mortality events, just to orient you, on the x-axis we have time and days, and then we have salinity levels overlaid, and then on the y-axis here we have survival rate as a proportion. This is with the first iteration of the optimal temperature, and with this survival curve, whenever you see a vertical drop, that represents a mortality event. The longer the vertical drop, the larger the mortality event that occurred in the tanks. And with the vitality scoring, remember these fish started showing signs of stress at 24 parts per thousand, but we can see that first vertical drop doesn't occur until 27 parts per thousand. So that's that first mortality event. The highest mortality rate occurred at 30 parts per thousand, and then we actually had one fish hang on for 10 days at full strength seawater, 33 parts per thousand, which is pretty remarkable for a fish that came from a body of fresh water. There was no mortality in the control fish um, in this treatment. So now we can compare this survival curve to that of the warm water treatment. We can see here it follows a really similar curve as the um, optimal temperature just shifted to the left, similarly like we saw in the vitality scoring, which was interesting to see. Um, with the vitality scoring in this warm water treatment in red, the vitality scoring fish started showing signs of stress at 21, and the first mortality event did occur at 21 parts per thousand. However, it was only one fish on day seven, and you can see we don't have another um, vertical drop until about halfway through 24 parts per thousand. The largest or the highest mortality rate that occurred in the warm water treatment was at 27 parts per thousand, and then the last fish lived um, for seven days at 33 parts per thousand in this warm water treatment. Once again, this was semi anticipated as warmer water, like I said before, it increases those metabolic rates and osmoregulation demands. Um, so, in combination with that salt stress, in those increased demands, um, these fish were dying at earlier salinities compared to that optimum temperature. And there was no mortality in the control fish um, in this warm water treatment as well. Lastly, we can look at our cold temperature treatment. So just as the unexpected apparent lack of stress in cold tanks is reflected in the survival curve. So there were no steep mortality events that occurred in these cold water tanks. There was 86% survivorship after a week at 33 parts per thousand, and there was a significant difference in the survival rates of these cold water treatments versus the other two treatments. There was some background mortality in the control tanks in this cold water treatment. We had five out of 60 control fish die, so there was actually no significant difference between the control and experimental survival rates in this temperature treatment. So this is indicative that round gobies can survive high saline waters, at least temporarily in these cold regimes. So what does this mean for the Hudson? So based on this lab study with ideal conditions, it's indicative of gobies' ability to survive throughout the entire estuary and major portions of Long Island Sound, since gobies were still alive after 30 parts per thousand in all three temperature regimes. However, surviving and establishing are two different things. While there's still survivorship at 27 parts per thousand and beyond, Approximately 80% of remaining experimental fish at the optimal and warm water temperature treatment were stressed based on that vitality scoring. They weren't eating, they weren't moving, indicating an imminent death. A majority of fish based on that vitality scoring were behaving somewhat normally at 21 to 24 parts per thousand. They were eating, they were swimming, they had healthy coloration. Um, so I think it's with these low to mid 20s, I think there is potentially some establishment potential that occur in the Hudson River estuary at the salinity levels, which is um, conducive to basically the whole entire estuary and then those western bays of Long Island Sound. However, we need to keep in mind, once again, this is a lab-based trial with ideal conditions. Gobies in the wild are going to have to deal with a multitude of stressors. And just because adults can survive low to mid-20s does not mean that there won't potentially be a bottleneck at a different stage of life. So I actually had some reproduction occur in both the optimal temperature 
and the warm water tanks. Um, these were both in control tanks at one parts per thousand. There's a garter male up there uh, fanning his eggs. And then I actually had one clutch of eggs in an experimental tank in the warm water treatment that was hatching at 15 parts per thousand into 18 parts per thousand. And then I was shocked when I was doing water changes and saw that there was a couple of, there might be some of that. There's a small larval goby that was still alive after a week at 21 parts per thousand in that experimental tank. Since we had reproduction in these tanks without even focusing on sex ratio or size distribution, we decided to run a third experiment, which my undergrad Eliza Ryan did, looking at reproductive capabilities at varying salinities. She's a poster, um, so be sure to check that out. So lastly, if round goby are able to continue establishment and proliferate or expand in the Hudson River estuary like they have in other water bodies, there's a multitude of potential impacts and novel interactions that will occur. I just want to highlight that the Hudson River is home to iconic species that are ecologically and economically significant, such as the Atlantic and short nosed sturgeon, as well as striped bass that may be impacted by this round goby invasion. So just because round goby are small fish, they do have some pretty big impacts. And with that, oh my gosh, this clicker, man. Um, with that, I would like to acknowledge my advisors and collaborators at Cornell, New York State DEC for funding this project, and the Hudson River Fisheries Unit for their continued support and guidance. Thank you. Sorry for all the technical difficulties. There's got to be at least one question. Okay. <laughs> how many fish were in each treatment, and how did you handle mixed result in the three metrics that you looked at? So there, for the optimal temperature, we had 200 experimental gobies, um, and then we had two control tanks of 40 gobies. And then in the warmer temperature and colder temperature, we had 100 gobies at each temperature.